Hi, this is Chuck Braverman. This is another episode of Westock Online. We have a great episode today with a filmmaker, a teacher, a traveler, an entrepreneur, a YouTuber, and I can't wait to introduce you to him. But before that, I want to remind you that we're brought to you in part, as usual, by Real Screen, Real Screen Summit. Real Screen Summit is coming up in January, January 23rd to the 26th in Austin, Texas. Austin's a pretty awesome place. I've been there by a couple of times for South by Southwest. And uh, Real Screen Summit is if you are a filmmaker and you want to meet other filmmakers and executives at uh, major networks, this would be the place to go. So uh, the easy way to find out about it is to go to our website, Westock online.com scroll down to the very bottom and there's a nice big colorful real screen summit logo just click on it it'll take you right to the page sign up there and i'll see you in austin texas january 23rd to the 26th so today uh it is my pleasure to uh have the filmmaker matthew o'brien uh, on our show matthew hi how are you doing great chuck thanks for having me it's great to be here it's my pleasure. And uh, unlike most of the other filmmakers that I have on the show, in some ways I feel like I, I know you because I've, I've seen so many of your videos. And you, because I, I edit this show on Final Cut Pro, uh, you happen to be a Final Cut Pro guru. I don't know if you would call yourself that. I certainly <laughs> would. And, you know, beside getting help with Final Cut Pro, you you talk about um, your journey through the filmmaking world and all kinds of tips and your your friendships with other YouTubers online and, and I don't know offline, but certainly online. I just I just went through your site at YouTube and noticed that you have recommendations for a whole bunch of other YouTubers, which I didn't even know that you that you had, but I've seen you with others. Um, and it, it resonated with me an episode that I watched the other day, which I think is maybe your latest episode about yeah. your personal journey from, um, I want to be a filmmaker. Should I go to film school? I'm in my twenties already. And I know that you went to Florida state. Do you want to tell us a little bit? I'm, I'm very interested having taught myself, you know, having gone to, to, to film school myself mm -hmm. several months ago and having taught <laughs> having taught at USC and Cal State Northridge I'm really interested in your story and then I want to talk about the filmmaking and YouTube and all that stuff so had you all let's just pick it up you know I know you were in your mid-20s yeah. and you decided had you already gone to some college or you'd not been to college before or what was your status when you were trying to decide to go to film school yeah, so without spending too much time on the, my undergrad, I, I was in uh, three different schools for undergrad. I started out at Iowa State University studying computer science and then hated the programming side. You can tell from my YouTube channel, I'm pretty technically minded, but I couldn't like code Final Cut Pro, but I know how to use it. Um, so I switched from, from uh, computer science to an English and French major, and I went, why am I paying all this out-of-state tuition to study English and French? I'm going to go to an in-state school. Uh, I grew up in the Chicago area. So um, I went to community college, got my grades up, and then I uh, applied to the University of Illinois for English, but they weren't accepting transfers at technically the sophomore level because I had failed a class at Iowa State, so I wasn't a true junior in college. So they said, but there's some alternate programs you can apply to. And one of them was theater. And I'm like, well, I did one play in high school. Why not become a theater major just so I can get into the University of Illinois? So I applied for the acting program there. And during my um, interview or uh, my tour of the school, I said, how many people apply to this acting program? And they're like, oh, like 700 to 1,000. I'm like, okay, how many get in? And they went, uh, 15. And I went, what have I done? I'm not going to be able to get into this school because only 15 get accepted. So I did my audition, uh, and by some miracle, I got into the acting school. So I was in an intensive acting conservatory at the University of Illinois for four years. And then when I graduated, moved to Chicago, uh, I started a theater company with some fellow grads. Um, 
was auditioning for stuff. I was in a couple bit parts on like the History Channel, uh, auditioned for Shakespeare plays, all that. But I went to myself, you know, I don't really like acting. I don't like memorizing the lines. I don't like the stage fright that I have to deal with every time I'm going to go out on stage. So I was in a theater in Oak Park, Illinois, and I'm watching a movie, which I always did as sort of therapy, like something that could just kind of get me escape, but center me. And I went, I wrote plays in high school or in college. I really love writing. I think I'm going to, I'm going to pursue a career in screenwriting. So I started writing screenplays, decided film school was that shortcut that I talked about in my YouTube video. It was a way to accelerate my learning and try to fast track my progress. Um, and that was the decision I made. So I applied to USC, UCLA, Boston University, Florida State, all the different film school programs. Um, got into Florida State and Boston University and chose Florida State and then began my two year intensive studying there. And I don't know if this is a fair question to ask. Your personal story aside for a moment, mm -hmm. how would you rank your Florida State? I mean, are you glad you went there as opposed to, you know, Boston or? I'm, I'm glad, uh, you know, Boston University was sort of um, a, a sort of a last minute thing. And I didn't really realize that they had like a true film school, but their screenwriting program was pretty good. And I looked at the alumni and did my research and I was like, you know, I could really see myself there. It was a big city having grown up in Chicago. I like the idea of being in another big city versus Tallahassee, which is fairly small as far as cities go. Um, but ultimately, because Boston University was a private school, it was, um, it, it was I think, $60,000 a year to go there. So I was looking at over $120,000 in debt, potentially, to go to, to go to two years of screenwriting school. And so Florida State, because they offered in-state tuition one year and out-of-state tuition the first year, um, they were just a better choice financially. But then what I really liked about Florida State was they gave you a full semester of production, even though you were in the writing program. So like in my video, I got to be on set, cycle through all the different positions on set for the first semester of school. So, the, you know, the first four months or whatever that I was there. And I thought that that was really important to be able to take those skills into the writing um, component especially because we had to edit our, sh our, our short films. So not only do we have to direct them, we had to edit them. And it really taught you, I felt like, you know, you, you're not in your screenwriting necessarily like writing shots and, and doing a lot of that in there, but it really helped me understand how to write uh, for the reader a little bit more and just think through, like, what does it actually take to, to get every beat of a scene to communicate emotionally what you want to communicate? to the audience. Did you have any um, photography, video background? I mean, had you been running around with a camera since you were a kid or was it all new to you? When you yeah, got, so, got so it's there? funny that you asked that because I've, I've been contemplating doing another video similar to the film school video, a vlog on my channel and this tentatively titled, I've always been a YouTuber. And I had worked on a video on my channel last year after I went home for summer break or for a little summer vac vacation with my family. And I had digitized some VHS tapes from when I was younger. And in those VHS tapes where I was documenting moving to Iowa State University, I was documenting my summer um, with my girlfriend at the time and everything that was happening at the end of my senior year and into, um, into my first year of college. There would be moments where I would film myself with a VHS camcorder on my shoulder in a mirror talking to the camera. And I had this, looking back at this, I had this profound realization like, I've always been making YouTube videos. I just didn't have Final Cut Pro and a computer and all that stuff to actually post-produce them. Um, so even before that, my brother and I, I mean, we grew up watching movies. My dad was a high school English teacher, but he also taught film at at our high school and he showed ah. he showed 35 millimeter <laughs> film and 16 millimeter film to his students in the high school auditorium where was this this was at woodstock high school in the far northwest suburbs of chicago um woodstock cinematically if that's even a adjective um is uh 
is known uh, for being the location of Punxsutawney in Groundhog Day that was directed by Harold Ramis starring Bill Murray. Um, well, so that so was you, another... T so you do have a bit of a background there. But so, so they had a 35 millimeter projector at a high school? Yeah, they he showed he showed most of the stuff on 16 mil, but I believe he they had a they had an old 35 millimeter projector, wow. and they would rent the reels and show them uh, and do the reel changes and everything. Um, and so, so that so 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 they allowed you. So you were an out of state student because you were from out of state, and then because you'd been there for a semester or a year, then they yeah. considered you an in state student. I think it was a way for them to try to be more competitive in the film, to go very competitive film school arena, you know, trying to go up against USC, UCLA, Loyola Marymount, all the heavy hitters in the film school side. Florida State was trying to be aggressive in getting students to come there by doing two things. They let you have in-state tuition um, your second year, but they also paid for all of your short films. Um, I guess you could argue your tuition did that, but you didn't have to find any funding for your short film. So they paid for the six, super 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter film, all the processing, all the digital conversion, um, all of that stuff. You used um, Aeriflex cameras. They had a Panavision, I think, 35 millimeter camera for the higher level films. Um, all the audio, I mean, everything. It was, you didn't have to stress about financing your own films. Oh, interesting. So when and I went to school, I, if I, you, you, you're not going to believe this. I mean, I <laughs> went to USC from my, I'm pretty sure this is accurate from my memory, a year's tuition at USC yeah. at the time was $2,500. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that so. was a lot. That was a lot. And I, yeah, sure. and I, yeah. I had to pay for it actually myself. Mm -hmm. And I was on yeah. what they called a work scholarship. Uh, so I worked for a number of hours every week for the, mm -hmm. for the university, but but it was through the film department. So one year I was I was the guy with the 16 millimeter projector that I pushed around campus and I would run films in other departments, right? Yep. And then mm -hmm. the other the other semester I was in the equipment room handing out the cameras and the lights and all that. So oh yeah, it, it was a great job, but. Yeah, and we we were really strongly encouraged not to even think about getting jobs anywhere while we were in school. It was such an intensive program, especially for the production students. Um, it really wasn't feasible to have some kind of job outside of school. Now, yours was in school, and there were opportunities to be like a teacher's assistant. Um, and I think in the film cage, you know, the, the where people checked out equipment, there was, you know, one person could do that part time out of you know 30 or so of us between the production kids and the writing students so the options were limited and that was the same for my undergrad in the acting school i was on on campus from 8 a.m till often midnight especially if we were in rehearsals for a play they're like it's really not feasible for you to have a job to help offset some of the tuition because not only do i have student loan debt from grad but I still have student loan debt from my undergraduate studies. Um, and I brought that also in, in, you know, that was part of my world when I applied for film school at Florida State. So your video, your YouTube video, mm -hmm. which I would highly recommend if anybody who's watching this is thinking about the possibility of going to, to film school. Um, it, 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 do you want to do the the short cheat version of yep. of what you said so i'll let you tell uh, you know what you recommend or don't recommend if you're 20 yeah. something years old and you're you want to go to film school you're thinking about it. because but but with the disclaimer which you don't really say in your video but i'll say now there's a huge difference between now and what was it 14 15 years ago when you were huge. making the decision right absolutely but, yeah, so in, in the video, I'm really just asking, was it worth it or do I regret having borrowed $90,000 to go to film school at Florida State? Um, and my conclusion was, I do not regret it because at 2006, for me, it was the best decision at the time. This was before digital cameras. What I'm shooting on right now, which is a Canon C300 Mark II, it didn't exist back then. It wasn't even, it wasn't even a glimmer in Canon's eye um, back then when we had the XL1 as our little quick go-to camera in our film school classes to do basic stuff. 
we were still shooting on super 16 millimeter and then doing a digital transfer so there weren't a lot of options to teach yourself filmmaking because the barriers of entry were so significant um, and I talk about that in the video but then the big question at the end is if I was 26 in 2022 and saying to myself I want to be a filmmaker with film school being one of the options to achieve that would I take on that amount of debt now to achieve my goal and my answer was 100% no I would not borrow 90 plus thousand dollars in student loans to go to film school now even though I found that experience tremendously valuable um, I love everything I learned there I wouldn't be where I am right now I don't think without that film school experience but I think I think in today's world with what you can learn on YouTube with what you can learn by getting a camera like this for not a lot of money and then again how the internet has sort of decentralized the traditional filmmaking paths um, both independent and through the Hollywood system um, there's things that people are making on iPhones now that make it into the premier film festivals and they can launch a career um, having invested very little in that process other than their time energy and persistence so um, so that was really what I was trying to to say in the video not necessarily telling 26 year olds who are thinking about film school right now that they should 100% drop any 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 uh, plans to do that but you know just to relate my experience and how it would impact a decision that I would make today of course what you didn't say I, right now and I'm I guess it was the subtext was that one of the major influences today is YouTube which absolutely is, you know if you want to know how to run that C300 camera or an Airy mm -hmm. or black magic or anything the second largest search engine on the internet is YouTube right and you can learn almost anything including how to how to use Final Cut Pro which you teach very well yeah uh, but and the other thing which you didn't mention which I'm I'm just going to which has stuck with me, which I think is the the positive, you know, beside learning what an f-stop is and what depth of field is, sure. you get out of film school something you can you don't get on YouTube, and that's networking with other film students who are going to be your your friends, your compatriots, your employer or your employee, and your your coworkers, right? So, uh, and and I think I'm still friends with a lot of the guys, and I say guys because, <laughs> yeah. I went to film school so long ago, there were no women in, in the film school. I mean, there were no women in the film school, period. You know. Yeah, and we were very fortunate even 15 years ago at Florida State to have an incredibly diverse class between men and women, um, various sexual uh, sexual orientation, and then, of course, uh, women from Taiwan, a Muslim student, um, you know, exposure to so much diversity even 15 years ago at Florida State. It was great. But, so, but the relationships and networking component for sure is one of the huge takeaways from Florida State. But I would argue, and, and maybe it's because I'm a creator versus a consumer of content on YouTube, but the family, my Final Cut fam, I call it, of other Final Cut Pro YouTubers and filmmakers that I connect with through an app called Discord has been unbelievable. Now, these are people that I have not met in person, but we've video chatted, we talk on our Discord, we're trying to arrange for sort of a meeting of the minds in Salt Lake City, sort of a central location where we all are and where one of my friends lives, and to pursue some filmmaking for YouTube um, uh, collaborations out there between our channels. And I think that the, the community that you can build on YouTube, not only with your audience, but with your fellow creators, is really profound. And I would say comparable to the community that I had coming out of Florida State, it just took a little bit more work to, to, to access it and cultivate it. But these modern tools, again, like Discord and the YouTube platform itself, um, have allowed me to connect with people uh, and become close with them, very similarly to how I did in film school. Um, so you graduated from Florida State. What do you get? What did you get there? You get a, a master's degree or a bachelor's degree or a so so supplement? I got a yeah so I got an MFA and the degree title is technically writing for the stage and screen because 
our writing program was a hybrid theater and um, film program. That's very unusual, I would say. It is. That, so, yeah. and then you came out to L.A., right? So I moved, my, my now wife, she was my girlfriend at the time. Um, we moved to Los Angeles in September of 2008, literally the week that the Great Recession happened. Everything fell apart the week we moved to Los Angeles. And that was one of the ingredients in um, sort of what I what I consider my failure in in not only having a strategy for my time in L.A., um, but, uh, you know, access to work that would have allowed me to 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 stay out there longer than the three years I was there. And what what did you do when you got here? Did you have any contacts or did you get any work at all? Because that. I'm, yeah. I'm just curious as to how that that was for you. So there was a little bit of sort of going out there on a wing and a prayer. Um, I didn't have like a job or anything lined up, but a good friend of mine from undergrad, Nick Militello, he was working um, in the concert touring industry. So he was doing, he, he came up through lighting design, but he started creating the screens content for major acts like New Kids on the Block, um, the, the TV show So You Think You Can Dance, they went on tour. So they would have these LED screens at these shows and they would put different content on there, whether it was footage, smoke, star fields, you know, all this stuff. So he was creating all that content and the week I got there, he was doing two shows at once and he's like, dude, I am so slammed right now. Do you know Final Cut Pro? And I'm like, I used it once for a short film. I, actually, I hadn't used it. I used Avid for my short film. I'm like, well, I used Avid on my short film. I can probably figure it out. So he's like, well, come up to Burbank with me and sit in a windowless room 14 hours a day for seven days a week for the next five weeks, and I'll pay you a pretty good amount of money. And I'm like, heck yeah, first week while I'm here in L.A., and I've got a gig lined up already. Um, so I sat there on a 24-inch iMac editing in Final Cut 7, uh, all this concert media content, and Nick, everything that I am able to do with Final Cut Pro on my channel, Nick laid the foundation for that as my mentor and, 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 and uh, you know, wise sage taking me through all of these post-production um, elements. <clears throat> everything from how to edit video to using hard drives and rate arrays and coming up with all these little shortcuts and things to save time. It was a, a really remarkable time to learn so much about post-production. And so for the next three years, I was in essentially an intensive, very unique post-production workflow doing concert video content. And then at the same time, Nick and I, because he had aspirations to direct, we were coming up with ideas for short films and and this is when the Canon 5D Mark II came out, and you could do cinema style video on a three thousand dollar camera body, mm. and we were blown away by this. I'm like Nick, do you understand what we can do with this camera? We don't have to, we don't have to rent an Alexa or if an Alexa was even out, I think it was the Amira at the time. We don't have to rent these incredibly expensive camera systems. Uh, we can make these films ourselves. So um, part of our journey was creating some of these short films, and uh, I'll just touch on one of them. We, we were up in Vancouver shooting for So You Think You Can Dance Canada, and I'm like, we got to make a short film while we're up there. We have all this free production design because we're in the historic Fairmount Hotel. We're in Vancouver. Like, let's come up with an idea. So he had had this idea um, where his next-door neighbor's smoke detector was going off, and it was making that beep sound but they were out of town and he couldn't do anything about it. And it was making him crazy. And I'm like, that's a short. So we adapted that basic concept of a smoke detector beep is going off. You can't do anything about it. Um, and we adapted it into a little horror short that we shot on a Canon 7D in this hotel. And then we edited it in Final Cut Pro 10 because it had just come out, did sound design, color grading, we, we, we actually burned it to a bunch of DVDs because that's how you had to submit to festivals. And we submitted to a bunch of festivals and got into a couple of them with our short. And I'm like, this is it. Like, we figured it out. This is how we're going we're gonna to break in. So were you trying to write screenplays at the, right, at the same yeah. time? And how 
So what happened with that? So the whole time I'm in Los Angeles on breaks while editing these the screens content with Nick, I'm writing spec screenplays. So the whole time I was there, I think I wrote maybe 10 specs. And my stuff was sort of um, typically kind of like a hybrid between something that was very steeped in genre, um, but then also, you know, tapping into that more indie art house aesthetic. I really wanted to try to find a way to have very character strong stories, but that touched on a lot of the, the, the touchstones of genre films like thrillers, dramas, and, and um, uh, uh, horror films. So I wrote a bunch of spec screenplays. Um, I was able to get read by, a, by an agent at UTA and she you know, really liked how I wrote but didn't like the script. Um, uh, I got connected with a, a manager while I was there. Um, he represented a screenwriter named John Scott Three who wrote a blacklist script called Maggie that eventually got turned into a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Abigail Breslin. Uh, it was a zombie, a very like kind of like what I was doing, that kind of art house genre hybrid. Um, so then when I partnered up with my manager, you know, I had other scripts and we, tr you know, tried getting them option, tried getting them in front of different producers that we could partner with. We never took a script out wide while I was in Los Angeles, like, you know, to all the studios. Um, it wasn't until I had to pack up and leave for Omaha where I wrote a sci-fi action uh, spec script called Arc One where we partnered up with a production company in Santa Monica and they loved the script, the idea for the script. And we did like a year's worth of rewrites. And I think this was back in, I think it was maybe January of 2015. They took that script out wide to all the studios, Paramount, um, Lionsgate, uh, 20th Century Fox, Sony, all of them. Uh, and it got just this close to getting picked up at Paramount, but they felt that they had another property that was too similar. And I think that the, the property that they thought was too similar was Alexander Payne's downsizing film. Um, and oddly enough, Alexander Payne being an uh, Omaha native, uh, and I actually saw him the other day when I was at the park. Um, uh, so it didn't get sold and that project fell apart and I haven't um, submitted a spec for consideration for purchase since then well it sounds to me like you were very productive actually while you were in LA even though you said you know you you arrived when it sounds like you know the depression was starting or the recession was starting and it made you made it sound like all the doors were being slammed in your face and yet I, I don't know it sounds like you were doing you know, if you were working and making some money, you were doing well, right? And it it just wasn't enough. The work with Nick was so sporadic. And although the pay for that five weeks was really good, I would sometimes have to stretch that pay two and three months between gigs with him. And because I was rolling the dice on getting more and more work with him, I would use those breaks between jobs to just, I mean, I would write five pages a day was my minimum. Like you have to write five pages a day. Um, to keep, you know, to, to stay on pace with what you need to put out to have the best shot at selling something. Because that's really what I was hinging everything on. It was on winning the lottery with one of my specs going out wide and selling for $150,000 and giving me this breathing room with a car payment, my debt, $1,200 a month in rent, cell phone bills, internet, you know, all that stuff. And my, my, girlfriend who then became my fiance while we were in Omaha or while we were in Los Angeles she was trying to find full-time work but unemployment and underemployment in LA was upwards of 25 percent and here she is with a marketing degree from Iowa State University and there's so much incredible talent and you know people from Ivy League schools that are struggling to find work in Los Angeles it was next to impossible for her to find anything so she had applied to like over a hundred jobs over the course of the three years that we were there and got one phone interview the whole time. So she's making next to no money. I'm making good money for short periods of time, but then trying to stretch it. And what ends up happening is you start putting stuff on credit cards and that you go from going to LA with $10,000 in the savings account to by the time we had to literally go from, we're going to live here the rest of our lives to 
we are selling everything in our apartment, packing up my Mazda and driving to Omaha to live with your parents. Um, we went to negative $30,000 and most of that was on credit cards because we were rolling the dice again um, on, on winning the lottery with the screenplay being sold. And it, it, didn't, it didn't end up happening and we got close but my script didn't sell and then that production company told me I'm like, well, can we take it to Netflix? Can we take it? They're like, it's dead. There's nothing we can do. It's over. And I'm like, well, that just seems like crap to me. Of course, one thing that I've learned over the years is that you can go pitch a project at a network or a place. Mm -hmm. And six months later, you could go back there because there are different people there. <laughs> They're, true i i i i i pitched a series to animal planet years ago i remember mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with a couple of talent walked in with a treatment and just got a you know this doesn't work for us it's not for animal planet and literally when maybe it was six or eight months later with a different set of executives went back with the same exact project and sold a pilot and got a commitment eventually for a series so um, the only thing I'm suggesting is you, maybe you should look back, look at some of your screenplays and think, what's viable? What works today? And the fact that you're in Omaha right now doesn't mm -hmm. mean, I mean, you could be in Hong Kong, right? Or Yeah, that or, doesn't matter or, now. Or, or anywhere because of the Internet. And nobody even knows where anybody is anymore, right? So when... When the proverbial uh, poop hit the fan uh, during uh, the end of our three years in L.A., we had a decision to make. We could move to the Chicago area where my parents were living and trade one expensive city for another, or we could go someplace where the cost of living is much lower, um, but we still have components of a city. Um, having grown up in Chicago land, but being in Chicago in my early 20s, I'm like, I don't want to live someplace that isn't doesn't have some kind of city infrastructure. Um, and Omaha, you know, for people who haven't been here is sort of probably perceived of as, you know, a very small town, but it's a great city for movies. Um, you know, there's decent theater here. Uh, you know, it has a city feel to it. Uh, and that was really important to me, but there's no traffic. And that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and how what how was the transition to youtube how did that happen and tell me i'm, I'm interested in that experience now yeah no that's great so you know um with coming to omaha thirty thousand dollars in debt 90 uh, over a hundred thousand dollars in student loans and literally living with my in-laws for nine months until we could get ourselves dug out enough to afford $650 a month for rent of an apartment. You know, we got to that point, I was freelancing. Um, I started working with a production company and I was their post-production supervisor. I mentioned in the video, I helped them go from 80,000 a year to half a million a year in, um, in, in gross revenue. Um, so I was doing a ton of post-production supervising. Uh, then I transitioned back to freelance after that gig and decided to start my own production company. So I'm going to work with different corporate clients here in Omaha and do documentary style um, branding content for their website, for social media. You know, a lot of it was talking head interviews with documentary style B-roll, and that's what I'm going to do. So I did that for three years with moderate success. I never really had enough like payroll for myself to like really put a dent in my student loans, save money, put towards retirement, all that stuff, because I was investing so much in the business. Um, but I started getting frustrated that I was, I was coming up in Google search results and these businesses just wanted to hire the lowest bidder. And I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, um, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. And that dynamic really bothers me. I do not like feeling like I am just a button pusher, someone who knows how to push record on a camera, and then I'll be told what to do. Uh, when you come to me as a business with a problem and you want to create a video to help solve that problem, I want you to think of me like I'm a doctor who's helping you treat cancer. You know, when you have an illness and you go to the doctor, you don't tell them, hey, doc, look, it's pancreatic cancer. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to do a CAT scan. We're going to go in for surgery next week. Here's the nurses and everybody you can hire to make that happen. Sound good? 
oh yeah, and by the way, uh, you're going to charge me a thousand bucks for it. A doctor would be like, you're, you're crazy. Get out of here. I, this isn't how I work. So that's really what I felt. I'm, I've gone to acting school, film school. I, I know all these, these elements. I hire a cinematographer, a sound person, all these resources that I bring to bear from the filmmaking process. And I'm just video after video. I'm like, the client is telling me what to do. The video sucks. I'm not excited to show it to anybody. Um, this isn't what I want to do. So then the pandemic happened. And I went from a bunch of client work lined up to none. And so I said to myself, well, I've been kind of documenting my process as a, as a filmmaker for these corporate clients for the last two years on my channel. I need to start creating content for my channel that can, um, you know, earn some revenue. So that's when I started saying to myself, well, what am I good at? Well, I was a post-production supervisor. Why don't I teach the internet how to do post-production supervisor? We'll start with Final Cut. We'll teach people how to get stuff into DaVinci Resolve for color grading, sound turnover, how to store and archive your media. I'm like, I'll just teach all that stuff like I've been doing at the, at, at, for all these businesses. And that's what I did. And then it took off. And um, uh, I did that Final Cut Pro tutorial, uh, nine tips for Final Cut Pro that feel like magic. And, it, you know, it, three or four months after I had published that video, the the almighty algorithm swept it up into a wave of of exposure to people all across the world and my subs my subscriber count went from like 59 subscribers to 100 then 500 then a thousand um then renee ritchie who's a big tech youtuber he was tweeting out my video saying how much it helped him with his workflow and it and that was it. That sealed the deal for me. Were you and doing I, anything to promote your... You, I mean, I, th th this is part of the process that I'm really interested in. You, yeah. know, you say you had 100 subscribers or whatever number, and then it was 500, mm -hmm. and then it was... You know, now it's, I think, 20 plus thousand or something. And I notice you have over Correct. a million views on YouTube altogether. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, were you taking out ads or tweeting like crazy, or was it the algorithm that just sort of discovered you and it was like... Yeah, it was, it was, you know, and, and I, I, I try to, I tr you know, I've, I sort of changed my thinking from thinking of like the algorithm as this sentient, um, artificially intelligent being that picks videos that it thinks are going to do well to th really thinking of it in terms of the audience. And what I had to say to myself was, how do I create a video that has real value to viewers? Because so I so I sat there and said to myself, and I, I promise I'll get to your answer. I know I take the circuitous route sometimes, but I had to say to myself, what were those moments when I was using Final Cut Pro and Nick or someone else said, oh, you're doing it that way? Just do this. It's just one button. And I would go, what? I've been doing this for six months and I could have been how much time I could have saved if I just did that. So I went through and found all nine, like nine things that I thought were like mind blowing and I, I, my strategy was, you are going to provide so much value to the viewer. They are going to be so blown away by these tricks in Final Cut Pro that your video is going to have to take off. And, you know, it didn't do very well for the first, you know, three or four months. And then all of a sudden, it just, the snowball effect. Viewers kept responding in the comments. I didn't know you could do this. Oh, my gosh. It, it, you know, it actually delivered on the premise that it promised. And audiences just ate it up. And to this day, it's still my highest performing video, I think over 150,000 views, and still brings subscribers to the channel. Um, and this was th two, three years ago that I made that video. So so it, it really did happen organically, and I made sure I followed it up with additional Final Cut Pro videos that were very similar to it, because I knew that Google or YouTube would then serve that video up to people who had just watched the main video. And sure enough, those videos, even though they didn't get the same amount of views, they would start snowballing and subscribers would pile on and the channel really grew from there. What are the economics for you, for yeah. uh, YouTube? I mean, how many views do you have to have for it to mean any, any significant money, any income? <laughs> 
So I'm very transparent about my revenue that's associated with the channel. And I have videos. If you go back at the um, at the beginning of this year, 2022, I did a video that broke down all the different um, revenue streams that I had from YouTube and how much I made. Um, so all of 2021, where I was making content very specifically to earn a living from it, I grossed $7,751.51 from Google AdSense, from affiliate commissions on products that I recommended on my channel. And if I use a special link, I get a, a commission from the sale of that product. And then a couple other revenue streams like the Medium Partner Program, which is sort of YouTube for articles. I think I made $6 from that all year long, writing articles every week about the things I was doing on my channel, um, stock content sales, a couple of other sources of revenue. And then to give you an idea of where things are looking eight months into 2022, my gross revenue right now, and I have done some film crew work here in Omaha to the tune of maybe, let's just say $5,000. I'd say probably this year so far, and again, nothing to get crazy about, but I've probably grossed about $25,000 from YouTube and all of the ancillary revenue streams that it generates. Well, that's significantly better, I would say. So uh, now that Mr. Algorithm has discovered you, right? So then you think about some people like Casey or, yeah. uh, you know, whoever, eight-year-old kid who's opening up toys. I have, there's a kid that yep. lives in my neighborhood who's like the highest mm -hmm. grossing, I don't know how many millions of views. They must, I mean, I guess the, the amounts of money that they get are insanely ridiculous, right? Yeah, I, I watch a channel called Colin and Samir, and there was a, a gentleman on there. His name's Air Rack, and he has a channel that has over a million subscribers. And they were asking him, how much per month do you make just from Google AdSense? This is the 45% the cut that you get from the ad revenue that YouTube gets from all the advertisers that advertise on that channel specifically. And this young man was generating fifty thousand dollars a month in just rad ad revenue um and this month i'm actually going to have probably my biggest month for ad revenue um the a couple of videos i did with uh, marquez brownlee kind of looking at his workflow in final cut pro and kind of breaking down where he might be able to improve um, I also did a live stream about the new Final Cut Pro update that came out a couple weeks ago, which was, you know, a very minor update. But that video has over 10,000 views because it's the number one search result on Google right now. If you search Final Cut Pro 10.6.4, my video is at the top. So that's another thing that's amazing about YouTube. And the entire world, <laughs> the entire world, and I know Final Cut Pro is a small subset of what's searched for, my video is number one. Um... So, so I'm, I'm, I'm closing in on, and this is going to probably sound underwhelming to people who earn, you know, a, a larger living than me, but I'm closing in on over $800 for the month in ad revenue. Um, and for a channel with 20,000 subscribers, uh, you know, I think that's pretty good that month after month off of this content, I can do $800 a month. But then really the beauty of YouTube in the, in the creatorpreneur space is two things and this is why i have fallen in love with content creation the thing that bothered me most about hollywood and screenwriting and what i had to go through to try to break in was especially as a screenwriter you have obstacles people gatekeepers that keep you from taking what you create and getting it to an audience especially because screenwriting you could argue is the architect, you know, the, the drafting of a blueprint that then somebody else most likely is going to turn into the finished product that's going to go before an audience. So there's all these barriers. And I didn't like that with screenwriting. I mean, Chuck, I, I had a production company that had shows on network TV. They had movies, spec scripts that had been bought by the studios. I mean, everything going for it, millions of dollars in revenue, and my screenplay we sent out to agents. None of them would rep me. And we were taking this 95-page 
spec um, sci-fi action script that you would think, other than it not being based on IP, checked every box that these studios were looking for. And we couldn't even get an agent. And that greatly hampered my ability to do what you were talking about before, which is going in and pitching. I never pitched one thing the entire time I was in L.A. because I didn't have the representation that could get me in the room. Um, so I'm just like, you know, and then I think back to when I'm standing in the mirror with a VHS camcorder on my shoulder going, I want to connect to the audience. And that's what I realized YouTube does. I can put my stuff, good or bad, poorly executed or masterfully done in front of an audience and they will decide if it has value. And even though I don't have half a million subs or a million subs at this point, other YouTubers have done that um, on, on their channels. To me, it's just, it's a, it's, it's just a magical feeling to be able to go, I have a vision for a video, like my film school video. I'm going to go shoot it all day. I'm going to edit it like crazy because once I'm like locked into that vision, uh, like you can't pull me away from the computer until I get it out. And then I can upload it to YouTube and my audience gets to decide if it's any good or not. And that connection is really powerful to me. And it makes me honestly almost say to myself, I would never sit down and try to pursue screenwriting the way I did before again. I am going to use YouTube to build an audience and get myself leverage or power to make connections with filmmakers like you or to get on other people's radar or for people to go, we wouldn't normally buy your spec script, but you have half a million subscribers on YouTube. And when we think about what that would convert to, to rentals, sales, box office, admit whatever, even if you're just the screenwriter, we can tap into that audience to help promote this film and take some of the fear away of investing in it. And I think that that's really powerful. And if, if spending five, seven years on a YouTube channel and building an audience gives me that route back to the Hollywood and traditional system, but with that leverage and that you know, I'm not, oh, please read my spec, have your reader at the agency read it, and if they like it, maybe you'll rep me. And then we can start trying to get writing assignments and pitch and all that. No, I'm just going to go straight to the audience, and that's what YouTube allows me to do. So when I was teaching, uh, I taught production documentary and at SC and more recently at Cal State Northridge. The first mm -hmm. day, first thing I said was, you don't have an excuse anymore not to be making films because, you know, the cam. You know, you don't have to buy the film. You don't have to process the film. You don't have to make no. a work print. Cameras are cheaper, better, faster. Blah blah blah. And YouTube. And why don't you have a YouTube channel? Why aren't you on YouTube every day? You know. Mm -hmm. And some of the kids took it to heart and and uh, and we're on YouTube and we're doing things. So um, it's it's a fascinating story and. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not surprised by anything you say, and I'm encouraged. On the one hand, on the other hand, it's sort of, it, 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 it's sad in a way. I think the one of the things that they don't teach maybe so much in film school is, especially in our business, I think you have to have a very thick skin, uh, 100%. and 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 understand that you're going to be rejected over and over and over and over again and it's not necessarily a reflection on y your talent no. i mean you know my brother is an actor and yep. you know we, he would come back from an audition sometimes and say boy i really killed it today i was great and never hear a word and then sometimes he would come back i can remember from an auditions how, how would it go he said i was terrible and that would be the job you know he would get that job right so, I mean, where's the logic in that? And, well, and, and with my acting, that's where some of the seeds of, of having a real strong connection to YouTube started. It drove me nuts where I would go, like, I have to get permission to work. Like, I want to make stuff. And that was part of the impetus to start the, produc the, the theater production company was, you know, I could, I could be cast by our group of, of 
collaborators in something um, and and then bring it to an audience. It was always this, and I don't think I was aware of it at the time, but it was always this incredibly strong desire to connect with an audience. And it drove me nuts that I had to audition. And, and now if I was in, uh, pursuing acting, I would be doing TikTok and YouTube and I would either teach technique or I would make little short skits or get my friends and, and recreate scenes from movies. I mean, I would be putting myself out there a ton to develop an audience that would then make a casting director go, you know, if this person auditioned um, a year ago, I, I wouldn't say yes, but now that I see their following and everything that they're doing, I can see, what, you know, whatever. There's other factors that make them an, an interesting choice for this, especially if you have a, a, a big social media following. And it gets you work that way. Um, I, I just hate the idea that I have to wait for someone to say yes uh, for me to for me to connect with an audience. And screenwriting and acting was always that, and YouTube isn't. And that's why I love it. Well, speaking of TikTok and some of the other platforms, do you are you on the other platforms at all? To, to the same degree? Yeah. So I, I I have cooled off a little bit on my TikTok account, but I do create, um, especially because YouTube has their shorts uh, videos. But I do create a series of videos called Six Tips for Final Cut Pro in sixty seconds. Um, and I have those on TikTok. I haven't made one in probably three or four months because I've been so consumed now with creating main channel content, especially as sponsors are coming to me. And that's something else I'll just touch on quickly. When I was doing corporate stuff here in Omaha, you know, you have to seek them out or you have to convince them they should make a video or you have to do these sort of you know, what's recommended is these traditional sales methods of, you know, this is why you need a video for your business. Um, I don't like that dynamic. What I love about YouTube is these brands see my channel and they come to me going, we want in on what you're doing. What's the, what's it going to cost for us to collaborate? And so I'm able to draft these proposals for these brands and say, well, here are three options for you to get on my channel. And some of them, they don't have the budget for it, and others do. And I'm sitting here going, <clears throat> this is going to take off as far as revenue goes for my channel. And as long as my following continues to grow, um, it's going to uh, improve. And part of that, too, is you know finding an audience on TikTok so that across all social channels, you can really bring a lot of value to these sponsors um, by saying, well, I can post it on YouTube to 20,000 subscribers, and I also have 10,000 followers on TikTok, they can see your product or service as well. And uh, that's a really, um, a really powerful place to be in as a content creator, especially if you have your choice of sponsors so that you can be really selective, so that you don't betray that sort of pact you have with your audience, that you're only going to show them things that, have, that has value to them. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna say, I want to say thank you. What a pleasure it is, and I think you're a really interesting guy, and I know that you're going to be successful, one way or the other. Mm -hmm.